Okay, so we're here with uh, Channel 9 here uh, in Building 10, and uh, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, who you are. Uh, my name is Yifan Yechero. I'm testing the document stack for Avalon. I've been doing that for about two and a half, maybe close to three years. Okay. Um, and I guess that's the, the long <laughs> So you're an SDET, is that yes. the, uh, that's the official that's sort the official of uh, title? title. Yeah. And yeah. when you see the document stack, just, just tell us a little bit about you know, what kinds of things that is. So we've got, um, so the document stack is, you know, it's one of those things that um, if you're into traditional UI programming, uh, most people don't really know the depth of, of what's in there. So um, a good way to think about it is it's a set of it's a set of controls and, and classes that are in the framework that give you the ability to do the same kind of rendering that IE does without necessarily having to try it in there. But it, you also get some of the features that you would get in Word. Um, it's fully programmable, which means that you can build an object model of paragraphs and you know um, lines and, and things, figures and floaters and things like that. Um, you can attach event handlers on them. You can set properties on them. The whole nine yards. Um, support some advanced features and documents, um, which is stuff like automatic hyphenation for you, um, spelling and stuff like that. It's 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 really huge. Cool. And, yeah. So that's that's the, the flow documents, right? Flow and document. those kinds of things. Yeah, flow documents. Some of the editing. Some, some of that stuff. Right. Right. And stuff. And, and just out of interest, I mean, how did you how did you get into all that? How did you how did you get here for starters? <laughs> um, I so out of college, towards the end of my um, my college experience, I got here for an internship, and it was with Avalon, interestingly enough, and it was with the controls team, and it was testing um, hosting Win32 controls, and I built a little test suite of like all the Win32 common controls running in Avalon back then, um, which was like. <laughs> um, so then after that I came back to full time hire working in layout and with documents and I've sort of been there ever since right so, yeah. right okay and uh, now you know I guess we're at uh, RC1 we're uh, yeah. r sort of shipping up well to uh, or shaping up well to ship yeah. <laughs> yeah. get those words the right order so it's, it's mostly tightening stuff up um, the document stuff has been you know pretty close to ready Mm -hmm. um, for for a bit now, so it's it's just mostly just the time. <laughs> so I think you may be the first uh, tester that uh, certainly the first tester I remember interviewing from a WPF perspective. So I'm kind of interested just in a just briefly, you know, what what the role of a tester encompasses. What you know, what do you do that's different to uh, the other roles within or the other disciplines within uh, um, Avalon? So a tester's primary job is quality. It's um, it's measuring the quality of the product. It is finding places where there isn't as much quality and, and bringing it up. Um, so it involves writing. So because we're a, a platform for programmers, a lot of it involves writing code that we expect clients to write to verify that the scenarios actually work. Um, right. Some of them are higher level scenario things, but a lot of them are very focused, detailed, it's a code so that if there's a failure in one particular piece, it's really quick to go and pinpoint it. Um, and part of it is maintaining the suite of tests um, and keeping on top of them, um, making sure things are okay. Um, Do you have like a, a suite of tests? And it sort of implies that you run them in some kind of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, so. How do they get used? Every every team um, gets right a suite of tests. They're sort of you know. There's a whole process where you plan for them. You find out what are the most important features that you have to test, and you prioritize them in that way. Um, it, it's a huge platform, and you're not going to be able to test every combination of every scenario. And so you sort of have to prioritize them ahead of time, and then have a plan for implementing them. And you go um, do that. And then there's a, a suite of automation that, or an infrastructure that's built that. Um, does things like it runs your tests and collects results and then sends mail out for the results to be resolved. And you know, if you have failures, you go down and you find out why it failed and you file a bug if it has to happen and you push to get that bug resolved or you find out maybe it was your test code wasn't as good as it needed to be. And um, and and there's it's it's we've been writing tests a while, so <laughs> <laughs> so there's quite a bit of automated testing that goes on in there. Um, which is which is quite interesting because um, it, it, um, the 
it's very easy for us to improve the quality of the application or the, pro the quality of the platform um, because once you write a test for something that's automated and it's running, that thing will never regress. It'll never go bad. There's code out there that, right. that makes sure it's working. So right. all, you, all you keep doing is moving forward over time. Right. That's something I sort of learned. It's like <laughs> one of the big like ahas that came to me after a while. Right, right. So. So gradually, as you say, that it's impossible to... So, the theory is if we've got a test case, it's, that thing's going to work. So there's always a risk that you'll miss, you'll have a hole where there's like something you didn't cover, which is right. what the planning... That's why up front you decide what, what can we absolutely not miss and like plan around covering it. Right. But as long as you keep adding tests and you make sure your old tests don't atrophy, you will always be incrementally improving quality. Right, so, right. What do you think the key um, skills or the key characteristics of a good tester are? I mean, is it a different kind of so different, different kind of testers of will give you different answers. Okay. For me, the, right at the top of the stat, you must intrinsically be malicious. <laughs> 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 uh, there's there's got to be so um, so a good a good tester is kind of like a good puzzle solver. Um, you you have to be able to look at a system and you have to be able to sort of break it up into its sort of component pieces and, and look at the cracks in between and find all the points of fail, likely points of failure. You've, you've got to be good at that. You've got to be uh, a bit tenacious because, you know, the interesting bugs are always really difficult to, to get a handle on and if you don't have the patience for it, um, you just won't go after them, so you have right. to do that. Um, there's there's a there's a couple of other skills that are helpful, but a lot of it is curiosity, patience, and just you know just not un unwillingness to let go. <laughs> right, right. So. And, and how I mean, how do you measure you know good good but testing? Is it by number of bugs you file, or it's obviously more subtle than that? It's it's more subtle. I mean, there's the quality of the bugs you file. Right? Uh -huh. You can find you can always find a lot of nitpicky things, right, that aren't really important, right? right? Or you might get one person who'll find five things, but they're, you know, earth-shatteringly important. Right. So there's, the number of bugs is not that great a metric. Um, there's, there's a combination of the quality of bugs. Sometimes um, a, a good tester will work with their dev, and the, there are things you can do that will just knock bugs out of the, before they even get into the product. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some teams that just have um, a low number of bugs, not just because they have really good devs, but they have really good devs that are working with really good testers. Mm -hmm. um, um, so the measure of the measure of a good tester, really good tester, um, there is there are people who are good ad hoc testers. So you you bring them up, with, you know, you put them in front of an API, put them in front of an application, and they'll find all kinds of things that you just never. You know, weird combinations that you never <laughs> thought of. Um, there are good testers who are good at upfront identifying the risks and identifying what absolutely sort of needs to work and, and coming up with an excellent plan to sort of cover those things and we'll just go implement those things. And so you, with those kinds of people, you generally don't see them generating very many bugs uh, or they'll generate a lot of bugs sort of early on and things will just sort of, sort of die off at the end. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 there's no hard and fast sort of rule of thumb. That's all. That's all. That's right, yeah. right. It's the um, I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've been, um, you know, as as uh, at this point, you've been, you know, doing a few tool things, and uh, you know, I think you've you've got a specific thing to show us uh, yeah. today, which is a which is a testing tool, it's right? A test, yeah. So this is for stability testing, and this is this is sort of. Oh, I've written this Avalon application. I'm new to Avalon. I'm not really sure what the points of failures could be for my application. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to have confidence it's not going to crash in the wild. And so, you know, that's stress testing and you know, running over long periods. And so, this is a little app that I put together for um, the New York Times, actually. Um, so this is we were going to demo it, and we had about a week to just sort of brush it up and see and make sure that it wasn't just going to fall apart. And so this is a little application that I wrote that takes advantage of... So 
So this takes advantage of a, an, it's an old technology that's, that's gotten a new face, which is the UI automation stack. Some people may remember it as something called MSA. And so let me pull up a really simple scenario. So the idea of the application is that there is existing infrastructure in, in every UI platform that Windows has ever put out. Um, and this is, this is for um, accessibility. And this is um, the ability for one program to take a look at the UI or take a look at uh, a tree exposed by another program and probe its UI. So we can ask questions about, you know, what elements do you have and what state are they in? Is this a text box? What is the text in it? And so I've taken advantage of that to write an application. Let's come around so I can okay. hit your screen well. So it asks an application what, what items are clickable on you. And what it does is it goes to that application and starts, did I spell that right? Untitled, oh, I missed the minus. It goes and searches by window title. You can get it to do it by process ID. But Notepad through the UI automation APIs exposes, oh, these are my menu items which are exposed. And it just keeps searching for them, it picks one at random, and then randomly decides to do something with it. Um, and so you can see how running this overnight with your, you know, fairly complex application may expose. Ooh, what have I got here? Oh, it's some of the help stuff. May expose some bugs that you may not have expected. So um, this is literally just randomly kind of taking advantage around. of the things that it knows are exposed and just hitting them and putting in random stuff yes. in there. Yes. So. You know, the nice thing about it is that although this is an Avalon technology and although this is I'm going to shut down. Two masters of this uh, window here, I guess. Uh. <laughs> so although it's an Avalon application uh, and it takes advantage of, an, of something that you know, comes back with Avalon mm -hmm. um, or WPF as we call it now, it because um, all of wind, all of the UI platforms that have come with Windows, um, because they expose these interfaces for UI automation, it's able to. So that was, you know, Notepad, regular old Win32 Notepad. Right. Um, it can do Win forms just as easily. So folks may recognize. There's a bunch of actions it does. One of them is setting keyboard focus, and so it, it seems to like that right now. Right. And it's not actually, but as you can see, it, it later on clicks on things. Now, there. This is an app that I wrote in about a, the core is written in a day of an, a day, and there's about a day and a half of, or half a day of bug fixes. This application was the most bang that I got for the least buck. So right. It's it's actually not very smart in that all it does is it clicks on items, sets focus on items, and it does some keyboard navigation. So there's more intelligent things that it could do. So for example, if it if the current item that it has focused is a text box, it could type strings into it. Right. Right. I haven't done that. Um, there's things about you may want to sort of lead it along a certain path in certain parts of your application and, and focus more on clicking and more on typing. So if you had like the notepad experience, I might want to do more typing than I do clicking. And so there's those smarts you can put in it. Right. But the core tool set to go and do these things, um, it's not that difficult to pick up. I I had no experience with UI automation. I just saw little bits and pieces here and there and I just mm -hmm. cobbled them together mm -hmm. and put it together. So you basic I mean you basically in, in creating this tool you use this 
um, SDK. Now, now, just talk a little bit about you know what you used and how that API is exposed and what you do to, to just access another thing. Um, so the primary, so a lot of them are hidden. Let's jump to source or. So there's there's two phases there's two two parts to it. Um, so in order for this to work across technologies, what I'm doing is I'm I'm p invoking into Win32 APIs to inject input. So it's a Win32 API called send input, which mm -hmm. is used to inject mouse and keyboard input. So I just created manage wrappers on those, and then there's a second half, which is the UI automation APIs. And so what you can do is you can ask for the root of a UI automation tree and you can walk the tree, you pick a certain set of elements and when you've collected enough you say I'm going to randomly interact with one of these and so you can now do things like get the dimensions of the element and then click in there or you can inject keyboard events to tab navigate or use the keyboard to navigate and things like that. Right. Um, and so the starting points I guess I could go with to automation helper um, VS on this box. There we go. This might be a little. So, with automation helper, so these are the helpers that I've sort of written. And so, for example, there's find window by title. And basically, there's. Um, Different items on your screen have different automation properties, and so basically, I'm cre I'm do I'm going to do a search. So this is this API I didn't write. This comes for free, and it says find the first item within the scope of my children that, you know, that this condition is true for. And right. the condition is a property condition where the automation element's name is some title that I passed in, uh -huh. and then that returns me the automation element. Right, and that has methods and properties for me to go and interact with it. Um, and so something that happens is that the automation element itself um, has this concept where different elements implement or expose different patterns. Um, is that the one I want? I think so. Um, and so there's, there's, for example, the invoke pattern, which button implements, which means to invoke something is to sort of execute the default action of that thing and there's a scroll pattern which scroll viewers do and there's a um, text pattern for items that expose text uh, here let me do this yeah, so here I grab an automation element and this is my test to see whether that element is clickable so it's, I say does it have an invoke pattern is it off screen and try and get a clickable point from it and if I can right. do these three things, then I know the element is clickable. And right. that's, that determines the elements I populate in my list uh -huh. before I go talk to them. And then you just randomly kind of go through that list that you've created and yes. just go um, click on each of them. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember the name of the list. Um, I know what to do. Yeah. Oops. So this is given. So here is a function I've written that basically walks a tree and for everything that, so this is a predicate that, make, that does a test that returns true or false and so for everything that returns true it will add it to the list as it walks the elements. And then that collection I just you know do a random.next between zero and the elements count and then I get an element back and that, that is the element that I'm going to play with. Right. Um, and so you know all the pieces are are sort of right there in the SDK and the samples are right there. Right. And it, it was just a matter of applying that to a specific problem which how for or another skill that you know a good tester needs, he must be lazy. <laughs> what is the least amount of work that I can do to get the most amount of gain out of this? Right. And so this, it, it's not that smart and if you have a really large application and you want to like get more, you, you might want to be more targeted about scenarios because this will sort of randomly waste time in a lot of places but if you want really quickly for very little effort to go in and run something for three days on end and know that just randomly banging on it won't bring it down and this is this is a great way to go right right, right. 
So how, how, I mean, obviously you've shown it there against Reflector and against Notepad, but, I mean, how does it get used here? What do you use it against? Um, you mentioned the New York Times. Yeah, kind of so the, the initial thing that it was, you know, sort of created to do was the New York Times. Um, there was, um, I've, I've had a couple of, like, you know, sort of slightly large applications uh, or medium-sized applications and internally for, to test with. And most of the stuff that I try to find are not necessarily crashes in the applications, but platform crashes. Right. Um, which I haven't had very good at doing. <laughs> <laughs> Platform's pretty stable. This was, I, you know, this was written, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's not that long ago. And so, you know, the platform's like pretty stable. Right, uh, right. Comparatively. Um, and, and so, for, for a couple of like sort of medium size, um, medium sized demos and, and things like that or internal applications mm -hmm. that we use. So we have a stability lab where we do like, you know, stability testing and s a similar concept it's used, but it's used in a more targeted way. So it's done for things like leak tests where there's a, a sequence of actions that you will perform and then you try and get yourself back to your original state. So for example, you may try and open up a document in an application and then close the document and repeat that a few times and then find out if your working set grew. Right. If it did, then you probably have a leak. Right. Um, so, so you're not just looking for crashes here, you're kind of looking for other kind of other, orthogonal sort of yeah. things. That so um, so there's things we do in the stress lab where we, you know, it's it's calling APIs and then seeing if, you know, we're going to get a crash if we do things in a random order. There's right. things like seeing if working set will grow unreasonably. Um, and so we have a stress lab where you know, these things happen and right. internally. Not this app, but the APIs underneath are, are pretty helpful for right. those kinds of things. Right. Um, but that's, that's and the, then pr again, the automation APIs, their primary use is for accessibility. Um, and so there, there are a few accessibility apps. There's UI Spy, which I'm not sure. I think it gets installed with the SDK. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure I, I think so. I'm not sure I have the SDK. Okay, no, I don't. Wait, yeah, yeah. No. Oh, that's the yeah. yeah, that's the, yeah. So, yep. yeah, so that application takes advantage of those APIs. Okay. In right. order to, it, and basically that exposes the entire tree of UI automation and it shows what patterns are available on them and, you know, what um, properties they expose. Right. And so you can sort of peek into your application and see what kind of data exposes, even and you don't have to write any code to enable that. Um, any anytime you use any of the default or standard controls, um, you get that for free. Right. Um, if you are writing your own custom control from ground up, there is an API. Um, if you look at Get Automation Peer on Framework Element, that's a good starting point to go sort of wander off and find out how to implement <coughs> or how to how your own custom control built from ground up can go and. Um, expose some of these properties and, and these patterns uh, right. that are used for UI automation. So that's get automation peer, you said? Get automation peer. Okay. The API. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this is cool because basically what you've done then is you've taken a, an API that was built for things like screen readers and sort of uh, accessibility aids and yeah. we've just sort of Repurposed piggybacked on it, yeah, yeah to kind of <laughs> turn this into this kind of um, test tool and, yeah. and, and really what you've built here is kind of like a I guess a UI fuzzer, right? I mean, yeah. it's a kind of a fuzzing tool for, for testing out yes. UI. Yes. So, so I, I mean, obviously, as you say, the, the platform, you know, hopefully you won't find too many more of these kind no. of uh, these bugs. But, but what, what could, you know, somebody watching this video, how could somebody watching this video use this for their own app? I mean, is, is it just something they just would just run against it or? Yeah, so again, with the least amount of effort, if you just run it against your application, um, you may find you may find that it will be. So, for example, um, one of the things that it's pretty good at catching is like sometimes some applications will do some network traffic and they'll go download something or, or and whatnot, and you'll find weird time issues there where um, moving to another piece of UI that depends on that data being on disk and that normally you would wait for the download to complete before moving on it, and it does you know those kinds of things for you. Um, Sometimes getting your application in a weird state or a weird UI state, um, right. it will do things like that for you. So just clicking on buttons in an order and that just, the design didn't think that they were going yeah. to be picked on. And, and you find out that um, even good testers are, are biased towards certain things. So there's a natural progression. If you click on a menu, you're more you're pretty likely to 
dig into the menu to find something to eventually click on. This thing just goes, <laughs> you know, just crazy. And so there's right. there's certain there's certain patterns of navigation that would just you just would not try, and right. and it, it finds things that right. way. Um, but again, it's very it's very coarse grained. It's very and it's literally carpet bombing your UI, and so <laughs> you have to let it run for a long time. And if you want to get more you know, if you want to sort of get it to mine more bugs out of it, then it does need some. So, in other words, the application that's running, it's just it's written to run against very general purpose applications. You may want to write the code in such a way to direct it more towards, say, hit a certain piece of UI more frequently than others, right. or do different things for different pieces of UI, and that right. sort of thing. Another thing to do is that you can. Um, you can write down a set of scenarios in which you say these are the ways in which I intend for people to use the application, and you write a little walkthrough, mm -hmm. and you can write a UI automation application that performs that walkthrough. And what happens is, you know, every time you build your application, you run this and that, and make sure that all your primary scenarios are are can you know be completed successfully. Right. Right. So let's say you have some um, an RSS upload thing, right? And so your test case would be click this button, click that button, type this text, click submit, and then do an HTTP request to see that the RSS item was successfully right. submitted. And you never have to do that again. You just get this thing to go do it for you every time. Right. right. So bringing it to more than just fuzzing the UI, but actually yeah, but going through a walk. Through like you were just going right back to what you were saying at the start of uh, this, this conversation about sort of uh, building up a test suite that yeah. you can continue to run and, and, uh, and make sure that and so you can move on to new features and every time you make a change that could impact old features you just run your old tests and find right. out if, if the old features still work right. right of course if you change the UI that's going to break yeah. a bit but so there's there's things you can do um, so for example you can mark certain items with automation IDs and so um, if so long I mean, you will always need to submit in order to upload, in the RSS example, you'd always need to hit submit to upload it. So, so long as you kept the automation ID on that item and right. the item was invocable, it wouldn't matter if it was a button or a radio button or a checkbox or whatever it was that it needed okay. to be. Okay, and you can rename the text in it or, or anything or whatever else. Whatever it is, right. Restyle it, just as long as it's physically got that ID on there. And that's like and, fluid and it, or something, is it? Or? Oh, no, it's, it's uh, just it's a plain text ID. Uh, I think, in, I'm trying to remember what, how you mark it in XAML. Um, I believe it's the x colon name in XAML. Just the kind of just the regular kind yeah. of name that is kind of used yeah, on code the element. And, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Except, well, if you're, you have to do a different. There's an API you have to call if it's a Win32 control, and there's another API you use if it's WinForms. Right. So. Right. Uh, so there's a variety of different approaches depending on which technology you're, you're using. using. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. And, and so, so how can people get their hands on this? Is this available in binary only, so, source and binary? Um, <laughs> so for this, this is very, very rough. Um, uh -huh. So for example, things like if your UI pops up a message box, um, it, it waits for you to undo the message box because it considers that a separate window. Right. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of cleanup, not necessarily to make it perfect, but to make sure it doesn't hose your machine. Um, and so after that, uh, we can put this up on, this is the WinFX committee site, which is... So wpf.netfx3.com? Uh, Netfx3.com, yes. Okay. So, I just throw it up there as a tool sample. Right. Yeah. So we can just get it up. I mean, by the time this video goes live, which is yeah. sort of probably be two weeks from the time we record this, maybe a little bit sooner. Yeah. We can get a even if it's rough draft, right? Yeah. It's, well, it will be. It will be rough draft. Like there's, right. Yeah. I, I can't spend too much Where time on this. Here. This is, this is Channel Nine. Yeah. Obviously. Well, no. It's, it's it's more. It's more that I'm shipping this. This. So <laughs> I, I can't spend too much time. Right. On, right. On, on this. But yeah. So the only the only thing is I just want to make sure. That, so every once in a while, it you know it will go off and try clicking in other places, and so I have to put a, a few more guards to make it just a little more smarter, right? And then put that up, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for showing us uh, this. It's a cool, welcome. cool technology and a cool yeah. way to use the yeah. accessibility UI uh, animation. Rules. Things. So, um, so yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.